All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started um, since it's this session and then lunch, right? Um, so I am Melanie Page. I am the new Assistant Vice President for Creative and Scholarly Activity. I just uh, got here in October from Oklahoma State. Um, so um, hello. And um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet and you haven't seen me running around campus, my job is to assist faculty in the arts, humanities, and social sciences pretty much be successful in their careers. Um, and so although in the research office our focus would obviously be external funding um, and national and international awards, you can't do those things if the whole rest of your faculty life is falling apart. Um, and so I've uh, had the opportunity to uh, be involved with teaching and learning commons and sort of helping and thinking about faculty development and working with Jenny um, and we're both really excited for this event um, and, and thank uh, the entire Academic Innovations Unit led by Sude Perutz um, for being willing to sort of rethink how are we doing things. So right, we in our classrooms we're always like, okay, do what's the latest thing, what really works for your students. And so the fact that um, Teaching and Learning Commons is willing to look at what their practices are and how it best serves us, the students, the faculty is really cool and exciting. Um, so here is the uh, website to give them feedback, not only on individual sessions, um, and you do not have to have capitals. Um, I just wrote, was trying to write big. Um, but they're really interested in feedback for the future. What kinds of sessions would be really useful? We know that everybody is really, really busy. Um, and so we want to have sessions that are really relevant and important. So what kind of services can we all offer you. Um, and so that's one way that you can give feedback um, to teaching and learning commons and academic innovations. So um, as you can see, um, today's talk is inter, multi, and transdisciplinary, oh my. Uh, so I was hoping that people would kind of get this um, when the title was out, um, but for anybody who didn't, it's a reference to <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Um, we're all of the generation, right, that we've seen, grew up and seen Wizard of Oz, so our students may not have gotten the reference, but hopefully um, we still do. Uh, one of my teams that I've worked on uh, doing research collaborations, uh, one of the PIs, is absolutely fabulous with fun titles and clip art. Um, and one of the things you'll find when you work on a team is that sometimes when somebody has a skill set, you actually want to come up to that person's level. Um, and so I try really hard to have like more fun and exciting titles. Um, and I love clip art. Um, so I hate PowerPoint. Um, but I tend to go off topic and ramble a lot, so this will keep me on topic. Um, I have no problem with people interrupting me, um, so uh, you can't distract me from eventually what we'll get back to. Um, and so if you have questions, you have comments, you have concerns, you have things that you want to discuss, um, let, let me know and, and we'll do that. As a reminder, this is being webcast, um, so if you have particular questions or issues you're working on, don't use names. Um, and so particularly if it's uh, uh, the Wicked Witch character on the team. Um, so, um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, sort of the three big projects that I've worked on at Oklahoma State. Um, one of these, uh, of course, this is you probably have figured out that the team that has the person who likes to do titles is the fish team. Um, and that was Families and Schools for Health. And this was a big obesity prevention project funded by the USDA. Um, and so it's really fun when you name your team and it's particularly something that uh, you can find lots of fun presents related around. So you would not believe the fish things that you could actually buy and give to people. Um, and you wouldn't know this if you uh, didn't, weren't looking for it, right? Um, the Signals Project uh, it was an NSF-funded project uh, working with colleagues in the College of Education and Engineering on increasing the pipeline uh, of girls in STEM discipline fields, but actually going back now and looking at what's happening in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Right? We know girls tend to, in middle school, high school, drop out of the hard science fields. There's not a lot of data on what's happening beforehand, so we have a real big sample following these kids across the years. Um, and then Oklahoma State actually had uh, what I call a baby advance grant. So we have an advance grant here that's the big advance grant that was lots and lots of money and resources. We had just sort of a baby advance grant um, at Oklahoma State. Um, and so 
um, everything we learn in life, right, whether it's positive or negative, is a, is a life lesson. Um, and so I appreciate all the lessons I was able to learn. And then this presentation today is based largely on a presentation we did in my own mind what was just recently, but it turns out it was actually back in 2009. Um, and so time flies, apparently, when you're having a lot of fun on research teams. Um, and so these are just, sometimes people get confused on what is an interdisciplinary team, what is a multidisciplinary team, what is a transdisciplinary team. To me, they're really all the same thing. They're about people working together across disciplines or across sort of thought processes. So even across the hall from yourself is going to be another person who has a different set of background characteristics, who has a different set of beliefs that you're going to have to figure out how to work with. Um, but if you wanted particular definitions, it really kind of starts with interdisciplinary people view as kind of this lower level of, you know, we're just maybe a psychologist and an engineer. We're still doing psychology and engineering things. We just happen to have some conversations. Uh, multidisciplinary is really when you begin to use maybe some engineering concepts in psychology or psychology concepts in engineering. So I had an engineering colleague who just wrote an article about how you could use some concepts from developmental psychology and raising children to solve engineering sustainability problems. Um, and he asked me to review that. Um, and so that's more of an example of multidisciplinary. Transdisciplinary people really used to sort of be like this whole new, once you've had these conversations and you've been working around together, you really form something new. You transcend the boundaries of those original um, disciplines and you form an entirely new discipline. So a common example is like bioinformatics. Um, and so uh, there's probably examples in all of your fields in which a new field is born, basically, from combining some other fields. Um, as we know, the large majority of research funding is going to teams, um, and particularly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. NSF, so the National Science Foundation, a couple years ago, they have two criteria that you have to address. One is broader impacts, and the other is intellectual merit. So does the project have merit? Does the project actually have anything positive to, to give to society. They tried a couple of years ago to throw in this additional criteria of transdisciplinarity. Um, and it was supposed to be a requirement, and I think nobody knew what the heck it was. And so even though it's kind of in the guidelines, they've dropped it as, if you don't address this, we're you know, going to throw, throw you out of the review process. Where, whereas if you don't address the other two, you don't even get reviewed. But it's good to think about this in terms of what sort of um, teams can you put together at the university um, with your colleagues at different universities? And how can you solve sort of bigger problems? Um, as you know, budgets are shrinking, right? Our state budget is shrinking. Foundation budgets are shrinking. Our personal budgets are shrinking. <laughs> I was glad to see health premiums didn't go up, so that helps with the shrinking budgets. Um, but nobody has any money. Okay? So this is no longer the time of flushness in terms of funding. So you have to think very, very strategically. And the people giving you the money have to think strategically. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I do with people is I sort of help them think broader about their research. Um, and we'll do that a little bit at the end. So if person A has the money and they really want to solve that problem, and you're over here studying B, how can you study B but relate it to A? Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So these are kind of my hints and tips. So I've been on teams that are fabulous and we're still collaborating. And I've been on teams where the countdown was painful to the end. <laughs> and you're counting the seconds. Um, and so this is across the teams that worked really well and across the teams that didn't work well. Communication has to be an absolute priority. Um, and you have to be honest and open with all segments of, of who you're communicating with. Um, and so what we found is that weekly team meetings with an agenda are really useful. Um, in one of our teams in which we like to talk a lot, we had to uh, res resort to a timer. Um, and actually, we just had to do this with our women's leadership pod as well. So we all like to talk a lot. We all have a lot to say. Um, we actually so had to set a timer. Um, in uh, traditional Native American circles, uh, it's, a, it's a friendship feather. 
Um, so that may be a kinder way to do it, is to actually have the feather on the table and somebody sort of undercover timing and then the feather gets passed. Um, and so as long as, you know, so you have this, everybody has the same amount of time to sort of say their piece and, and address their issue. Um, and then you have to have minutes. Um, if you have the meeting and you don't have minutes, I guarantee you three or four or five years down the road you have no idea why you decided to do something. Um, and it will have seemed so logical at the time. Um, particularly if you do something crazy, you won't know why you did it. Um, and so we, we learned the hard way on, on the FISH team, we modified a measure of childhood depression in a way that we thought was making it easier for the kids to understand. This was our thought process at the time. We went to get publisher permission for the measure and they're like, well, you don't need our permission because it's not really our measure anymore. Okay, well, we thought, this is great. You know, we don't have to pay anybody any money. It turns out you can't actually score the measure the way we modified it um, and measure childhood depression. Um, and so, but if we didn't have sort of this whole thought process, three or four years down the road when you're looking at the data, you have no idea why you did that. Um, so we at least now have a logical reason why we did it um, and now need to begin to think from a conceptual point of view, okay, what were we really measuring? Um, you know, if you're coding something within your data set, you know, um, if you used measure A versus measure B, you won't remember why. Um, so um, it's really important to document those meetings. Um, so what, what we usually did um, is we had our project manager um, be at the meetings with us, and this project manager was uh, an advanced student, and so if we had student personnel issues, we'd have them step out. Um, but the other issues, they, they could take the minutes. You want to communicate with uh, your college, with the university, and with staff. Okay? So we all know that we're really, really busy, um, and the kinder you can be to the support staff, the more that you will get done in a day. Um, and uh, at least once a year, we'd send flowers to the major support staff within the colleges who did all the financials. Um, and different colleges have different structures where um, colleges are more involved or not. Um, at Oklahoma State, everything is very college-centric in terms of research, so all the financial people, all the research support staff, are each college has those people. Um, at WVU, it's a little bit more centralized. Um, but we even, we have very, very complicated um, IRB, uh, Institutional Review Board procedure on the obesity project, and so we'd actually send the IRB manager flowers once a year. Um, sometimes we would drop off bagels, chocolates. Um, they will go a long way towards getting you what you need, particularly if you're not really good at timelines and you're sort of backing things up to the last minute and you need a favor. Um, and so uh, you want to keep that in mind. Be calm, right? Be understanding. Um, if the situation has gotten sort of uh, animated or agitated, walk away, right? There's nothing to be gained by continuing this argument with a person who's not budging. Um, um, so walk away, find your supervisor, their supervisor, um, or try another day. Um, and so they're, they're, you're, if you're butting heads and you really can't get anywhere, walk away and find a mediator. Um, and of course, um, I'm willing to help with that as, as my office is, so we can actually offer sort of mediation, you know, alms bus person kind of work. Um, absolutely share your successes with your, not only department chair, but with your dean, uh, with the provost, with the president, okay? Um, if people don't know what you're doing, they can't brag about you, they can't brag about WVU, uh, at the state legislature, to potential donors, to alumni, to parents. Um, and so if you have successes, so you've gotten funding, you've gotten an award, your project finds something really cool, you get published in one of the top journals in your field, you write a book, share that. Okay? Um, so, um, and particularly, obviously share it with our office. Um, we would love to know about it. Uh, in case you don't know, we actually have um, a director of federal relations who works on our behalf in Washington. Um, and every single feel-good success story that we can speak about, WVU helps us with federal funding. Um, and it's far-ranging things like money for the PRT. Okay. So uh, if we're doing really good work in our arena, then when the transportation bill comes around, they're like, oh, okay, we'll give you some money for that because you guys are really cool. 
and you're changing the lives of West Virginians. Um, so share your successes with us. Um, and obviously, communicate with your research assistants. Okay. Um, we found that drop-in visits to the lab are really important. Um, sometimes that's disruptive. Um, you know, so stay calm when you drop into the lab. Um, but it often, first of all, it helps students know you, particularly on a really large project with lots of students. So at one point when we were doing our interventions on the obesity project, we had over 70 students working for us. 70 students can't know each faculty member individually. We can't know 70 students. So once a week, we would drop by the lab and just be like, hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so. How are things going? Um, we also did, we made a training video um, with, I think, three or four of the PIs made this training video talking to the students, particularly um, the undergraduate students, about the importance of their tasks. So sometimes we have undergraduate students doing things that they might perceive that are boring or stupid or why do I even have to pay attention to this that are absolutely so vital to the success of the project in terms of organization, in terms of what they're doing, um, that, and they don't know the context. And sometimes they can't know the context because we can't bias them with the hypotheses of the whole study, right? So, um, so we made this sort of training video on the importance of doing basically every task to the highest level possible. That it may seem like a non-important task to you, but it really is important. Um, and then we have all of our students uh, take the CITI ethics training for research. Even if they're not required, we think it's a good idea um, because then they begin to think not only more ethically, but the process of making sure they're not inadvertently disclosing information they shouldn't. Um, we're big on rewards, um, so we love to give presents. So we would have a, a fish of the week, um, and so we'd select one student from the, the pool of students that worked for us that had really done some outstanding work that week as a thank you. Um, and then we, we had five PIs, so this was a little bit easier to do. Um, we'd all put in like $50 at the beginning of the semester, and then we'd give that out in $10 gift cards. Um, and so, uh, and uh, particularly one of my co-PIs loves to throw themed parties at her house. Um, and so she would do that at the end of the semester, um, or we take the students for pizza. Um, and, so, and that's, a, a, again, another way for them to connect to you, um, particularly undergraduates who don't have as much experience talking to faculty members. So on one of my most dysfunctional teams stemmed from poor delineation of roles and using the assumptions of the way we worked on Team A was the way all teams worked. Okay. So Team A was quite high functioning, everybody was got along and we just sort of the delineation of roles just sort of happened and there really was no territoriality okay. I strongly assumed team B would work the same way um, and that was not what was in the other person's mind so the other person's mind worked very hierarchically and very structured um, I work very collaboratively and hey if we need a task done I'm just going to do it Okay. That was not helpful to this person um, and actually caused a lot of problems. If we had delineated sort of our styles and our ideas of how this team was going to function beforehand, we probably would have avoided about a year and a half of animosity back and forth. Um, and so you know, once we figured this out, things got much better. Um, so once I figured out that my normal style of just doing things didn't work for this person and I stopped, it was so much better. Um, I wasn't doing work that wasn't appreciated, um, and they weren't feeling undermined. Um, and so it's important that you know that. Um, the other thing is to think about what are you good at, um, and how can you contribute to that um, team. Um, so I'm very good with budgets and details, um, and so I was the budget detail person. Um, that's, I know that's not mine. <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, so the you know other people are really good. So we had a person who was really good at um, organizing timelines for the whole project. Um, you know, and so figure out what needs to be done on the team. Who has the capacity to do that? And if you have no capacity for it, who do you need to hire? Who do you need to look for? Who do you need to look for as a potential collaborator? Okay. Um, 
and particularly if you're not willing to learn the skills. So if you have nobody who wants to get anywhere near a budget, okay, you have to hire a person who will do that for you. Okay? Or when you're looking for a graduate assistant, you have to find one who will do that and has that capacity. Okay. Um, talk about authorship and ownership of data at the start. Okay. Do not wait till three years into the project and the project now has blown up and who owns the data from years one, two, and three. Um, so on, on our most high functioning project, we had a bit of dysfunction in which one team member could not operate with the rest of the team. And so they left the project. It was a longitudinal project in which data collection was ongoing. It became a very huge, almost legal battle as to what data that person was going to have access to and how they would get access. Um, and we were eventually able to work it out with the, the help of one of the associate deans for research who acted as a mediator between the team and this person as to what data do you have access to um, and how can you access that. What, what uh, responsibilities does that person have then when they're going to publish that data to the rest of us who worked on and helped collect that data? Um, what responsibility then do we have back to that person in including them on presentations and publications. Um, and so make sure you have those conversations. It's a good idea, there's a module on CITI about publication and who can be on a publication, particularly if you're in a field that has a bad habit of throwing everybody on the publication, even people who didn't do the work. It's a really easy way to circumvent them blaming you for the guidelines of really what their ethical behavior should be, because CITI is telling them, this is what your ethical behavior should be. Um, so we had a team that had a bunch of PIs and co-PIs that were in name only, and one of the one of the other people that was actually doing the work said, well, oh, you gotta put these people on these presentations, these papers, I said, hell no. You don't work on the project, you don't write this up, you don't contribute, you're not on anything that my team and I are writing. Um, and so in my, my students and I did the most of the writing and the work on that project. I was like, uh-uh. Um, and I said, and CITI says that this is best practices. Um, just because, and this is particularly in really large labs in which there might be a PI who's on seven or eight grants, but they're not actually doing the work on those grants. It's students or it's junior faculty. Um, it's important that we begin to use authorship ethically. Um, and that person is not automatically on a grant just because they funded the grant or were the front person that funded the grant. Um, I would suggest avoiding email for difficult conversations. Okay? So the data suggests that people perceive email more negatively than it's meant. So a neutral email that you send is going to be perceived negatively. So think about if you're actually sending a negative email. <laughs> so your perception is like, you know, below floor level. Um, so as difficult as it is to have in-person difficult conversations, you will avoid so much drama and trauma. Okay? So on one of my teams, I actually forbid somebody from emailing me when they had a problem. So I said, I will absolutely not open an email from you, I will not respond, and I will not read it. If you have a perceived problem, pick up the telephone. I will be there in five minutes, we will have a discussion, you will see my face, we will see each other's body language, and we will see that we're actually on the same team. We may not be on the same page, but we're on the same team. We want the best for the project, we want the best for the university, and we'll figure out whatever problem it is. Um, and so that worked a lot better. Um, so once we forbade difficult conversations by email. Um, and then if you're considering somebody as a possible co-PI and you have no experience working with this person, find someone who does and find someone who will have a conversation with you, again, not by email, because this should be a confidential conversation, in which they will tell you if this person is a good risk or not. Um, so if we had done that on the project in which the person had to leave, we would have had information that would have suggested to us this wasn't a good person. So when we replaced her, because we needed to replace her expertise, we actually sort of interviewed her colleagues kind of behind the scene of, hey, have you worked with this person? You know, are they emotionally stable? <laughs> Will there be a lot of throwing of objects at us? Um, you know, will there be a lot of screaming and yelling, right? You don't need screaming and yelling at work. Um, 
you don't need to be fearful of a person's physical presence that they will harm you. Um, and so, you know, those are, and, and you also need to make sure they pull their weight, right? So we're all too busy to be carrying the coattail, people on our coattails. Um, and it's not fair to the people who are really working. Um, and so you need to make sure that the people you're putting on will actually pull their weight and do their part of the project. Okay. So be organized. Um, despite the fact that I teach stats, I love numbers, um, I love logic and I love structure, I am horribly organized. Um, so find a person on the team who's your organizer. Okay? The space must be organized. Okay? Your lab space must be organized. If the students can't find things, if you can't find things, you are going to be wasting an incredible amount of time and you'll be frustrated. Okay? So if you don't have a label maker, you know, get a label maker or get a Sharpie and some you know, tags and start labeling things. Label your file cabinets. Label your bins that if you're doing an inter we had inter big interventions, so we had big bins that everything is in the bin. Okay? There's actually a student who had the checklist and was the bin checker. Okay? Um, may have seemed like a silly job to the student, absolutely vital if you've now driven three hours to do an intervention and you're missing a key piece because nobody checked the bin. Okay? Um, and so, you know, we learned early on we had an uh, undergraduate bin checker, then we actually had a graduate student <laughs> that was the head of the team before they left. We're going to bin check again. Um, and so, you know, so the more you can label, the more you can organize, particularly if you have a lot of data coming in by paper, um, you absolutely have to have the inbox, you have to have the checked box, you have to have then the file box. Um, you have to know what needs to be locked up, right? So is this data that needs to be locked up and under the locked file cabinets, is it stuff that can be available to everybody? Um, you know, we do uh, a lot of shared drives, so people probably have a lot of shared drives. Organize those. Okay, so if you're not good at it, get somebody who's very good at seeing a structure and an organizational tree of where should things logically be so that three years from now when you need to know how to score a measure, you have the measures file somewhere that's really logical, not six trees in, where you're really frustrated and you're like, I know we have that. Um, assign a student, if you don't have the original um, articles or the manuals for the measures that you're using, compile them at the start of the project. Okay. Um, because usually when you go to actually analyze the data, right, it's under a deadline for a conference that the submission is due in three hours. And so if you need to spend two of those hours actually finding out how to score your measure, okay, you're not gonna, that's not going to happen. So everything you can do up front, um, the better. Um, pay attention to how your data are processed. So if it's a really large project and you've got a lot of data coming in, thinking through the process at the beginning will save you a lot of heartache. Um, so on our obesity prevention project, a large amount of our heartache has actually been around data. Um, and the fact that we have 1,200 kids that we followed from first grade through fifth grade. Um, and so we have a lot of data on these kids from several different sources. Um, and so having your code book done up front, vetted, you know, having a procedure in place for cleaning data. We've probably cleaned the same data like seven times. <laughs> Um, and part of that is our being naive as to the level of person that needed to be the data manager. So we hired graduate students. I really wish we had put a full-time person into the budget. Project management and data management are the two most vital things in your project. Um, do not skimp on the budget if it's a large project. Um, so the research office actually is developing a project management, resource management, budget management team um, that you can actually buy small amounts of their time. So let's say you don't need a full-time person, you need a quarter-time person. Um, you can actually buy our professional project managers who actually have degrees and training in project management. Your lives will be so much easier than graduate student A who's going to be your project manager. Um, and if you only have $30,000, so let's say you have $30,000 for a project manager, that will not buy you the level of full-time person you need, but it will buy you a great part-time person. And you don't have to interview anybody, because we they've already been vetted and interviewed. So you don't have to go through the hiring process. You don't have to figure any of that out. Um, and so that's one sort of creative thing that WVU is doing for the researchers. 
Um, and then be creative in your use of student resources. So if you don't have money to pay students, which typically in the social sciences, arts, and humanities, we don't. <laughs> it's very common in the hard sciences that you pay students. Um, it's uncommon, I think, in the social sciences, arts, and humanities that you pay students. Um, so be creative in your use of, of student resources. If, you're, if your discipline doesn't currently have independent study class for students to do research with you, make one up. Okay? So they're usually the zero-ending courses. Um, and so psychology uses these quite frequently. My colleagues in human development, they really didn't use them, so they had to make one. Um, and now it's a common thing. Um, so we got our grant in 2007, now 2014, it's very now common. So we've changed sort of their whole culture within their, within their college and departments that, wow, this should be commonplace that our students are doing these types of experience, experiences. Thesis, obviously master's thesis and dissertation, um, but also senior theses or honors theses, this is great. If you are going to allow students to use the data for theses or dissertation, have a data use agreement for students. Um, that outlines uh, obviously who they are, what they want to do. Uh, they, we make the students actually have like a two-page lit review before we'll allow them to use the data. Who is your advisor? So you can't use our data unless one of us is your advisor on your committee. Um, and then we vet it to make sure that it's not something that one of the PIs or co-PIs, that that's the key part of their research, right? And then the student <laughs> goes and does the project, and now you've just been usurped by a, somebody else's student. Um, and then everybody's on the same page. Um, and so everybody knows what's going on, who's using the data, um, and we have a record. And then we require students to also sign an agreement on publication. So for your, uh, I think both for your master's thesis and your dissertation, you have one year from the time you defend to publish as first author. In the case of a thesis, if you do not meet that timeline, the uh, advisor can take that project back and become the first author if they actually then do the first author work. Dissertations, um, we don't take it back as first author because uh, most professional uh, organizations would suggest that the dissertation project itself would make you first author. But we do reserve the right to take the project and publish it. The student would remain first author, then the person who's actually the primary author is second author on that publication. Um, and so we make that very explicit with students up front because what happens a lot of times is you mentor students, they're using your data, and they go off and do their life. Um, and they're really not interested in publishing, and now you're stuck in this sort of limbo of, well, we never talked about who's gonna be, you know, what's gonna happen. Um, and so this is just really explicit up front for students to know. This is our contract. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Positive attitude will go a long way, right? If you've put together a team, you had a reason to do it, right? You had a goal. Um, and so if everybody on the team becomes enemies, you're not going to reach the goal. Okay? So always coming back to us as a team. The PI reserves the right to remove anybody from that team that they need to. Okay. Um, sending an email out to people on the team that says, if you don't comply, I will remove you, is probably not a good way to handle it. Okay. Um, having these conversations with people along the way of, hey, this doesn't seem to be working for you. you know, this doesn't seem to be working for us. Is there anything that we can do differently? You know, do we have different leadership styles? Do we have different communication styles? Um, do we have different discipline styles? So on our obesity project, we had people from, psych I was psych from psychology, we had people from child development, people from uh, family systems, and then we had our nutrition person. Um, so you can obviously see it was kind of a funny obesity prevention project with the token nutrition person. <laughs> um, but we had to learn what's the vocabulary in each person's field for even the term overweight or obese. Um, we had to learn, what is a publication norm? Okay. Is first author or last author the important position? Is sole author an important thing, such that if it was really important to somebody's field, the rest of us might choose to drop off a publication so that person could advance their career? Um, in a well-functioning team, you might do that every once in a while. Okay. Um, particularly after uh, I got full professor, I didn't care where my authorship was. So, you know, I'm like, put me wherever. I don't care. Um, we had a couple of colleagues who were still uh, getting tenure, 
And then we had a couple more colleagues who were still trying to get full professor. And so on the well-functioning team, you kind of trade spaces to help people out in their careers. Um, sometimes it makes a difference whether you're third or fourth okay, in a seven author uh, series. Um, so really thinking through, um, and of course if you've talked about authorship beforehand and what's important in your field, you know these conversations. Um, and so um, when it, my, my colleague Amanda Harris is incredibly good about gratitude before problems. Um, and so when people say, hey, how's the FISH project going, you know, and we would have like a slew of a million problems that we're trying to deal with. So it's a project out in the schools. Um, and so, and a non-academic project out in the schools, which is really difficult to sell to the schools. Um, and it also had a family intervention component. Um, and so there was a lot of moving pieces. She would always start with something that was gratitude about the project. Um, whether it was people related, whether it was school related, whether it was a great story. Um, that she had from, you know, uh, one of the things that we learned is principals are really busy, and particularly in Oklahoma, I don't know if it's the same way in West Virginia, if it doesn't relate to the state test in April, they really don't want to have a conversation with you. Um, so we learned the drop-in method, um, so that Amanda spent many hours on the road, and these are rural, rural communities, she'd just drop into the principal's office with some bagels for the secretaries. <laughs> um, and don't forget to cream cheese. Uh, free bagels without the cream cheese do not go as far as bagels with the cream cheese. Um, but she would just drop in and say, I'm here to see principal so-and-so. Um, well, they're very busy. That's okay. I have all day. And boom, she has her laptop, plops down. Um, and so we, I think we, probably the 30 schools we had, we probably only ever had two outright refusals and we only had one school drop out. Um, and that school was facing a, a whole host of regulatory problems, and so it made sense that they had to drop out. Um, but, you know, so, so having those personal face-to-face, -face, a researcher, the main researcher cared enough to come to my space is really important. Um, and so and I've actually considered doing sort of some drop-bys for department chairs who are being a little recalcitrant and meeting with me, like, hey, I'll just go drop by. <laughs> That's cool, I got all day. Um, so, so that, that's, a, that's a technique to think about. Um, remember that stuff happens. This is really hard. Most people who have their PhD who are academics are perfectionists, and they're really high achievers. Um, and it's really hard to remember that no matter how good you are, how organized, how anything you are, things will go wrong. Okay? And there's no amount of planning in the world that can prevent that. Um, and so developing this ability to roll with it a bit so we can prepare for a lot of things but sometimes things will just happen and it's okay it's not a reflection on you're not smart enough you're not good enough um, it's simply a reflection on life throws things okay? um, you know and so knowing that and working with that and you know not not getting so worked up that you can't sort of problem solve with your team um, have fun, right? If you're on a team and you dread every single interaction on that project, you need to remove yourself as much as possible from the project, okay? Hopefully you've had a good conversation at the beginning about what data you own, okay? If that data is on a shared space before you leave the project, get the data on a hard space. Make sure you're complying with all federal standards and IRB and that IRB you have the encrypted drive that you can have the data on. Um, so protect yourself before you walk away, but walk away. Okay. Um, you can't continue to do a project that sucks the life out of you. Right? We only have so many years on the planet. We only have so much energy and your job should not be something that every day you come you dread. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how to exit gracefully or how to remove yourself from daily interactions, perhaps, with the persons or persons that are sort of causing the most problem. Right? It becomes more problematic, right, if the PI is the problem causer. Um, and so it just may involve stepping back from the project, having a new conversation on delineating of roles. Um, so one of the things I did on a project is I actually wrote out and had both of us sign what were my duties, what would I be responsible for, and what would I owe back to the project. 
um, such that at no future point could that person argue that I wasn't doing what I was, what we agreed that I would do. Because um, oftentimes when you step back and you've been doing all the work and it doesn't get done, then you begin to be blamed. If you have a workload agreement basically that says, I will do these tasks, signed by both of you, um, it goes a long way when you need to have conversations higher up. Um, and so that will kind of protect yourself. Definitely celebrate success. Um, so uh, both Amanda and I are crazy gift givers. Um, and so, um, and particularly she would, on the anniversary of the project, when we got the grant award, everybody would get something fish related. <laughs> so I have fish necklaces, I have fish um, pictures, <laughs> I have a fish um, paperweight. Um, and so, <laughs> Um, and, and it's fun. It's fun to look at those things, particularly when the project ends, um, and look back on good times that you had with a, a well-functioning team. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, definitely making up awards for, for particularly for students. Um, it really helps them feel appreciated, particularly on a large project in which they may not understand where their piece is. That oh, wow, this is really great. Um, and then. Uh, Surround yourself with a team of smart, committed, creative, hardworking, knowledgeable, energetic, kind people, and everything will work out fine. <laughs> um, think about this when you're choosing your team. Okay? Obviously, none of us fits all of those things <laughs> constantly, right? Um, but really sort of thinking about making sure somebody's at least hitting 75% of these. If they're not, Unless they're the ones bringing the $20 million to the table, it's probably not worth pursuing. Right? It's probably not worth pursuing. Same thing if you're thinking about teaching and, and collaboratively teaching or when you put together a task force. Right? I would never put together a task force no matter how smart or intelligent the person was if they were emotionally unstable and dysfunctional and nasty to other people at the table. Okay? Don't need you. Okay? I will take somebody with a little bit less expertise and experience but who's willing to have uh, polite conversations around me. Um, and so really sort of being able to think about that when you're putting together teams for anything. Um, how you, if you have the choice, um, sometimes we don't, but. Okay. Um, and so then as promised, uh, as we sort of wrap up here, one of the things that, um, if you don't know, we have mountains of excellence for research. Um, we have made a commitment several years ago, as I understand it, that we would be the world leaders in STEM education, pretty much K through 12, but also talking about uh, college level. And the university has done something really cool where they actually call this FERN education, so flexible education networks. In terms of STEM is not just about STEM, it's about being holistic and putting together the whole person. Um, and so really all of us obviously contribute to STEM education because we're educating people. Um, using shale gas responsibly, uh, water resources is obviously huge within the world state. Uh, health disparities in Appalachia, um, so we have incredible health disparities here. Um, and then uh, obviously the most specific one is radio astronomy. Um, if you don't know, we have this really cool uh, telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, I think one of only three or four in the world. Um, and so, and if you read any news, you know physics and astronomy is is huge and exploding. Um, and so, this is another thing that we do really well. Um, one of the things I would encourage people to think about, and we don't really have time to do this today, um, but where is your mountain? What is your mountain? Okay. I have no no evidence of this. Um, so don't hold me to this, but I think the university is going to become more serious about the mountains in terms of where resources might go. Um, and so thinking about how does your research fit into these mountains? Okay? So the Obesity Prevention Project, I said it had one nutritionist on it, right? You might think, well, that's really weird. <laughs> you guys are studying, obviously, something that has a nutritional basis. The other four of us, so there was two of us that were interested in peer relations. So how do kids get along with each other? Um, we had a senior colleague who had done some work in um, cognitive development and nutrients. And then we had a junior colleague who was interested in family dynamics. How does where 
the type of family that you're raised in influence things more like peer relationships. And we had tried the year before to get a grant through Head Start to look at um, a program um, it's called You Can't Say You Can't Play. And it's where you can't, you make a classroom rule in which you can't reject children from recess play. Um, and so we really wanted to test this out in a broader context. Couldn't get any money. The USDA, this is 2007, so there's tons of money available. I know there's no tons of money now. 2007, USDA has a lot of money, and obesity is starting to hit the radar, particularly childhood obesity. So they have a ton of money to give away. So we all say, hey, they have a ton of money. Maybe obesity is a larger project or larger, larger problem than just input in, input out. Maybe there's some social dynamics going on. So we were all able, so we put together this intervention program, part of it around food and exercise, but the other part around family dynamics and then this peer uh, relationship thing. And so, and then we went and found our token nutritionist, because <laughs> you had to have one. Um, so sometimes there's the token social scientist, this is a token nutritionist. Um, and the USDA gave us a million dollars to study childhood obesity. The only thing that we had to change from project A to project B is we had to study BMI in addition to studying all these social variables we wanted to study. So we didn't have to change anything about who we were at the core to get the money. Okay, so sometimes people are like, oh, I can't change, you know, I can't try to go for that money because then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in my pure science. Okay? You can do your pure science at an outcome variable. Okay? Um, and so, and this is actually one of my particular talents. I could take anybody's research and relate it to any one of these mountains. Now, it may be very tenuous when we get to radio astronomy, <laughs> but I can make the connection for you. Um, and so I would encourage you to begin to think really broadly about what you do. Okay? Um, and so I was working with somebody yesterday who looks at um, gender and race within political systems and within politics, and within her field, a lot of the funding is going towards national security. And I said, oh, you are so national security. And she's looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, do you think we'd still be having the conversations on Benghazi if it had been a male secretary of state? Absolutely not. And she's like, wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's five steps removed, but it has ramifications. So thinking about which one of these could your work have ramifications into, you know, Shale gas isn't just about extracting the gas, right? It's about what kind of policies do we have around that? What are the economics? What are the environmental concepts? How do we teach children complex topics in science class, in civics class, uh, in math class? Um, and so really thinking about how do you fit into what some of the funding priorities may be as we go forward, um, but what's, what are the funding priorities right for the big world around us? These are it. So if you read every single organization comes up, except for radio astronomy, comes up with these are the big topics. And radio astronomy obviously leads back to STEM education, right? America does not have enough scientists. Um, it does not have scientifically literate citizens, no matter what their field is. Um, so it's really important that we contribute to that. Um, and so really thinking about that, and I'm, um, so, and this is, so I found like one of the weird pictures for Wizard of Oz, such that, we all know Wizard of Oz, we all know the um, sort of traditional pictures, the way we picture it, um, and this is just a little bit more creative spin on it. Um, and so sort of really thinking about where can you fit, um, and, and, if it's, and if, even if it's not in these five mountains, what is it in your field that the money is coming towards? And how can we position you to be part of that pot? Because um, when you have your own money, you don't have to ask anyone's permission to buy a computer, you can buy post-it notes and pens, and you can travel. Um, so if nothing else, having some indirect costs and a small little budget gives you freedom to do the things that drew you to the field in the first place, that you're passionate about, and you don't need to beg and plead. Um, and so that's, that's what I have. Do we have any sort of quick questions before lunch? I know we're all probably starving. But if you're like me, you ate too many cookies in the expo. <laughs> Okay, um, I have some cards up here, but it was Melanie Page. I'm online. I'm available um, at all times, um, and so I'm here all summer. I am very happy to come over and talk with individual faculty on career mapping, career development, uh, consult with teams, functional or dysfunctional, um, come over and talk to small groups of faculty. Whatever you need from me, I am here. So my entire job is your success.
Um, so please take me up on, on my offer. Thank you.